don't, but uh, Kim Harley shares a last name with Mark Harley for a very important reason. That's because she's Mark's mother. Um, so I said in the first service, if you like Mark, you can thank Kim because <laughs> she had something to do with that. So let me pray for you, Kim. But yeah, if you don't, yeah, if you don't like Mark, you better pretend in front of Kim or you will have an enemy for life. Is that fair? <laughs> I'm the father, so I know how that works. All right. Well, God, I thank you. Um, yeah, I just thank you for Kim. Thank you for her willingness to share. Um, I know that there's, yeah, I guess just courage and uh, discipline required for her to stand here and to share with us the things that she's going to share. And so I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you for the, the words of scripture that you have put inside of her, not just in preparation for this morning or not just in the last month, but over years, um, decades even of wrestling with the exact scripture passage that she's going to share with, with us this morning. So I thank you for that, God. Uh, and again, just pray that you would empower the the things going on in her heart and her mind to come out of her mouth and to speak to us and to inform us and that your spirit would be um, preparing us to hear so that we can be people who you know, just trust and obey and put into practice the things of your kingdom. And we pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Well, good morning, Buffalo Vineyard, those of you who are here and those watching on the live stream. I am so excited to be here and grateful for this opportunity. Um, so this passage that we're covering today is, um, encompasses my life verse, Philippians 4.13. So when I learned that Buffalo Vineyard was starting to study the book of Philippians, and Steve was inviting people to speak, I immediately asked if I could be a part of that. Um, and something I didn't mention er in the first service is, while I'm a stranger to you, you don't feel like strangers to me because um, one of the blessings of COVID has been that I've been able to be a part of Buffalo Vineyard, you know, every Sunday watching. And it, it's, it's been wonderful to do that. So while I feel like a stranger coming in, know that I very much feel a part of you. Um, but I wanted to use this opportunity to um, challenge myself to discover, like, why I say this is my life verse, you know, and put it into action. Um, I'm not a Bible scholar. Um, the people who have done this before me, they make it look really easy. It's not that easy. <laughs> um, but I just hope that you'll be patient with me as I trust and try to let the Lord use me to speak something meaningful to you. So in asking myself, and if we can flip it to my family, that's our family before I talk about this. Um, haven't always been a Buffalo Bills fan, but I'm full on board now. So um, it's awesome. I won't tell you who my team is. My son would choke me. Uh, <laughs> so when I asked myself, you know, why is this my verse? I had to do a deep dive into the scriptures to understand the verse in context and reflect on my own life to determine, you know, my validity to claiming it as my own. Um, the process helped me craft a message that I hope you will understand. Like Paul, you can, ab in, you can embrace this mindset. That's in Philippians 4.13. So Philippians is characterized as a book of encouragement. And I hope this message will uplift you and motivate you to grow stronger in your relationship with Christ by gaining a deeper understanding of his love. All right, so we take a look at this um, word cloud. And you'll hear throughout my message today many of the same words that you have been hearing the past few weeks and months while we've been studying Philippians. But it's very important that we remember who we're talking about and from where he is speaking to us. So Paul is in, in prison, and from his cell, he's teaching us some very valuable lessons on how to surrender and follow Jesus. When Mark spoke in one of his sermons, he reminded us that that requires a daily posture of surrender. Then Gail told us it means putting your life on the line and dying to self. Steve talked about the hidden secret, the great mystery to living this kind of life. There we go. 
Um, and Steve also told us that we're not just to survive, but to thrive. And I love that word. In Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul reminds us to rejoice in the Lord always. I can't help but hear that song in my head. Um, so you can see by the look on my face, because it took many takes to get that first picture that we took, um, that being with my family is my joy. It's pure bliss for me. Um, and that banner behind us, together we will see it through, is a testament to how we survive and thrive together. We often refer to ourselves as, the, as Team Harley to get jobs done, like the time we helped Mark refinish his hardwood floors over Thanksgiving. He's shaking his, ne his head no, because I'm not allowed to tell that story. Maybe another time, though. It was quite an adventure, I'll just say that. We trusted and tried hard. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at today's passage. We are looking at Philippians 4, 10 through 13. We're just going to um, cover 10 through 12 right now. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. So Epaphroditus has come to town to inform Paul of the difficulties facing the church in Philippi and to bring him a generous financial gift for bringing the gospel to them. Paul is delighted that he came because now he knows they're still com concerned about him. He says at last, not as a criticism, but as an indication that the relief, that it's relief, the waiting's over. It's not like they could call him, text him, email him. He acknowledges that they had no way to communicate their concern. But the bigger reason he's joyful is because he knows their ability and desire to give to him comes from God. He is rejoicing because now he knows that God is at work in their lives because this gift demonstrates their trust in him. So let's look at verses 11 and 12. Paul explains contentment. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So many philosophers um, during this time spoke of contentment in terms of self-sufficiency, but Paul is speaking of exactly the opposite. On. Paul has been to the school of hard knocks. He isn't just claiming this as his reality. He has learned it to be his truth through pain and suffering. In the difficult times, he recognized his strength was from God and through his Savior, Jesus Christ. He realized he could never muster the strength in his own power and abilities. Life's Is it on? Yes? Okay, here we go. All right, so Paul's been through the school of hard knocks, right? But he recognizes life's difficult circumstances have been his training ground. This is how he, he's learned these lessons. It was required, necessary. And Paul believes that God loves him and that Christ died for his sins. He knows that when he dies, he'll go to be with the Lord. So in life or death, joy or sorrow, his source of hope in Christ motivates him to fulfill God's promise and his calling for his life. So we're talking about contentment. When I think of contentment, I think of how I feel when I sit in my favorite place. So this is along a trail at a state park at Smith Mountain Lake, Virginia. I'm sure by my accent, you did not have to guess that I'm from the South. Um, so I'd love to go here, and I sit on this bench, take a break. When I sit there and I focus on the magnitude of this beautiful landscape, 
this peace just washes over me. I'm filled with a sensation that goes far beyond happiness and bliss. I'm content. I have all that I need in that moment, and I'm fully present with God. So taking this time out reminds me that God's in control. My anxieties diminish. Like Zach talked about last week, you just get those all that out of your head. So in telling you this, I kind of want to pose a challenge or an encouragement to you. I hope that you'll look for a place. Maybe you already have this practice. You'll look for a place in your house or outside in your neighborhood where you'll just regularly take time to go and sit and just be still. Just be present. Zach talked about that when he was worshiping this morning. Um, Just rest in his promises. And while you're doing that, I challenge you to notice how the how that clutter gets out of your mind and how your body just begins to release itself and sink sink in to that stillness. All right, so here we go. So this is the verse that I want to focus on. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So this experience has really challenged me to dig deep into the scriptures and understand what does this really mean? Because I use it sort of flippantly as my verse and claim it, but do I really know what it means? So to to figure that out, I decided we would answer three questions together. Um, Because if I I wanna know the answer, I, I had to formulate some questions to get there. And this verse, as you know, it's very popular. So my friend Tim Tebow here, like many people, claim Philippians 4.13. We see it all over. Um, so I'm, I'm thankful for this opportunity to call myself out, to be like, okay, do you understand in context what you're saying when you use that verse? And really identify why do I use it? I'm a big Simon Sinek fan, and he always talks about the why. So... This is exactly what I've done in order to be here today. I've spent time researching that. So I think it's important that when we see verses quoted like this that we realize they're not always presented in context and it's worth our digging to figure it out. Because Paul's sincere confidence in the Lord, no matter his circumstances, are what this is getting to. So what does that mean? So the first question I want to ask is, what is promised in this powerful verse? What's the promise? I can do all things. Does that mean that everything will go my way in all circumstances? No. We learn from Paul, it's a process. While it can certainly mean living in a joyful life, it can also mean suffering through heartbreak, sorrow, grief, anger, sickness, disappointment, despair, and the list goes on and on. But Paul said he's learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. It requires complete surrender to empty out yourself and become weak and fully rely on God's grace. So these are my baby brothers. Yes, we're named Kim, Tim, and Jim. I'll I'll save that for later. So one Christmas, my mom got us these t-shirts, and they say, it's a Morgan thing you wouldn't understand. So my maiden name is Morgan. Um, We are strong-willed, competitive, control freaks to a fault, bullheaded overachievers, all three of us. Can you imagine growing up with that? So oftentimes we just rely on our own resources to overcome obstacles to get the job done. And we just push through the pain and keep on smiling. And this is the ringleader of the Morgan Muscle Team, my dad, our very own Clark Griswold. We are a family that loves the movie Christmas Vacation. Sorry to admit that, but we do. And one of the main reasons is that guy in the other picture, our own Clark, he actually has experienced some of the same things that this Clark has gone through in that movie. 
including standing in the attic and his legs falling through the season ceiling of a bedroom, um, of a bedroom, yeah, where his feet then land on the bunk bed. So it's, it's really ironic to see how much he's gone through. So anyway, you know, I think that what we Morgan control freaks have learned is that self-reliant ambition can hinder progress and lead to catastrophes sometimes. And Paul was clearly an overachiever. He accomplished more in 10 years than most people do in a lifetime. We learned from him that self-sufficiency can lead to suffering but surrendering can be empowering. So next question is, what is required of us to be as worthy as Paul to claim Philippians 4.13 as our own truth? I had the privilege of teaching at the New Community School in Richmond, Virginia. It's a small private school for primarily dyslexic students and, and kids with other learning differences. The school motto is trust and try. So my baby brother Jim created this poster and we all had, um, we all had them displayed in every classroom. So we looked at it every day to remind us of what our philosophy was and how we were to help the kids. So every day, teachers would ask the kids to surrender their will, be vulnerable, put aside past learning experiences, the shame that they may have experienced, because the stories were shocking, honestly. Um, and we asked them that they trust the teachers to give them the knowledge and the tools they needed to overcome their educational challenges. So in response to that, what was expected, they had to abandon self-sufficiency, reject old beliefs, discard ineffective habits, and try new methods for learning. And that was scary for them. And some days they didn't do it. Every day was a clean slate. We start over, we try again. Because honestly, sometimes everything we learned the day before was gone. Because when you have memory issues and processing issues, you can learn something one day and it's gone the next. But when you're in an environment where you're with teachers who understand that and, and they are prepared to help you get through it, it's magical. So we agreed that we would progress together as fast as we could, but as slow as we must to be successful. Patience and perseverance were crucial. So when I was reflecting back on my experience at this school, so I haven't taught in over a year now. I think I might be a retired teacher turned full-time grandma now. But uh, we'll see. Um, it just struck me that, well, wait a minute. Trust and try. I looked at this poster every day for years. That's exactly what God is speaking about us to do with him. Just trust and try. Well, I don't want to say just because it's, it's not as easy as you'll see in this next video. It's not as easy as we want it to be. So sometimes it's really hard. Some days trust and try looks like this. and sounds like that. <laughs> so that's my youngest grandson, Owen. That's Mark's son. So he's trying so hard to crawl, right? He knows, he knows that he's supposed to be able to do it. He wants to get that soccer ball. But he doesn't always trust the process when he can't get his momentum going. He's just frustrated and disappointed. And, and that's what's going to happen with us, too. We're going to feel that same way. But then other days, it, it might look like this.
<laughs> so that's my Hudson, my other grandson. He's so eager to learn. He loves to put together puzzles. He trusts the process, and he continues to try over and over again. And you can see that his perseverance is building confidence and resilience. And that's what God promises to us. If we rely on him, he'll deliver. But he doesn't say it, won't, it will always be easy, that we might not feel like Owen sometimes. So my, my third question is, so if we ask what is promised, we need to know how can we daily live out this level of faith? We've learned what's required, what's promised. How can we do this daily to figure it out? What does it take? Well, it starts with grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. I've learned that the secret of contentment is God's endless love and forgiveness. His mercies are new every morning. There's a book that I love. I, decades ago, I read it. It's called In the Grip of Grace by Max Licato. And it permanently changed my mindset, I have to say. And I've rediscovered that book recently. So likewise, the more I learn about Paul... I realize being followers of King Jesus is not about focusing on our suffering. That's not what he's doing. It's about recognizing how Jesus suffered for me and recognizing that if he can die for me, I can show mercy to others and grow his kingdom by accepting his love and sharing it with all people by following his example of practicing forgiveness and grace. We must look to the life of Jesus as our example of how we're to live in love, obedience, with peace and joy, having patience and showing kindness, exercising meekness and self-control, and keeping the faith. Not the Morgan thing at all. So my husband and I will have been married 35 years this July. In every relationship, you must lean in towards each other to grow stronger. It requires trust and vulnerability, which is tough. The path ahead can be shady, and there will be storms along the way. I'm here to tell you that we have had catastrophic storms, but I'm also here to tell you God got us through every one of them. And, and, it, and, not, and it wasn't always easy. A lot of times I felt like Owen. But that's why this verse is so powerful to me. Now I can claim it authentically. It's much more than a tagline I sign and a card I send a friend. It's my lifeline. It's what I cling to. It's what I know to be true. We've had our own trust and try experiences. It's a process that requires starting over and over and over. You have to be willing to do the work. It's not easy. I think Paul is telling us that you can't be content in selfishness, but you can be content in selflessness. In all of our relationships, in order to avoid discontentment, we need to focus on the joy of the other person more than we dwell on our own happiness. Paul knows his suffering is happening for a reason. And that reason is to further the message of Christ. I, step I stand before you right now trying to do the same thing. So Steve preached about the downward trajectory, getting down on our knees, praying. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God. We have to have gratitude. It takes grace, and we have to have gratitude. We need to have an attitude of gratitude. I used to say that to my students all the time. I stole that from my husband. He was a teacher before me, and they got really sick of hearing it. 
Um, but they did it. I saw it grow. So we can give thanks to God for the good stuff, but real transformation happens when we thank him for the storms in the midst of it. And, and we know that we're coming out the other side having gained something. When we're broken and vulnerable and we allow his strength to reign in our lives, we see that God's plan is so much better than we could have ever imagined. And the painful process is worth it. But the journey to that mindset is not always easy. I see these maps every day, night, morning and night. They're in my room. So Richmond and Buffalo. So how did I get here? How's the Southern girl standing before you in Buffalo, New York? Well, a man from Buffalo ended up in Richmond, my husband. We met, fell in love, built a family, and now we're back living in a house in Buffalo that his father delivered milk to through that very door. That blows my mind. I'm like full circle that we're right back here where everything began because I never imagined that would happen. But you saw my joy on my face with my Buffalo Bills PJs on with my family, right? His plan far greater than I ever imagined. So it all started when my son met and married a beautiful woman in Richmond. I thought I had it made. Her family lives in Richmond, we live in Richmond, and I was like, yes. There's no way they're both going to leave their families. I'm going to get to see my grandkids. This is going to be perfect. Sure enough, what'd they do? Well, he left right after college to, and came to New York. So I'm still a little bitter about that. But, <laughs> um, but they moved. They moved to Buffalo. So I'd come to visit, and I used to cry on the way home, both flights, just tears streaming all the way back home after visiting because I missed them so much and I couldn't wrap my head around it. But then I also wrestled with the fact that when I was here, I loved being in this church. I loved the people, I loved the community, Koinonia, Steve preached on, and I knew that God had a plan for them and I thanked him that I have a son and daughter-in-law who love and serve the Lord. So we're here to be with our family and our grandsons, but I believe that God's ultimate plan and purpose for us will be revealed if I trust in his promises because I surrendered. I quit my teaching job, I left my Morgan family, and I headed north to focus on restoration. So we need grace, we need to have gratitude, and we need to give God the glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I also want to point out that I have Alex Phillips' name on a couple of slides in this presentation. She was one of my students who is now on the dean's list at her college, which is a huge tribute to her Persever perseverance and resilience. So we must give God the glory for everything we have and everything we are so others can see the light of Christ shining through us. True joy is the result of giving God our glory. Recently I heard the American poet Amanda Gorman. She said, there is always light if, we, if only we are brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it. And I, I found that to be so powerful. I was like, yes, that's exactly what the scripture's saying. It requires courage. We have to have courage to do it. And similarly, Paul tells us to become God's shining stars in a dark world. So sometimes it can feel like we are bound in shackles during the storms and trials of our life. But if we tether ourselves to God's mighty power, hold tightly and cling to his promises, his strength will keep us steady. Relinquish control. Let go of the reins. It might feel like you're free falling, but if you trust and try, he will catch you. 
He'll hold you in safe in his arms, and he won't let you fall. I'm here to tell you that. His strength is limitless, and his grace is boundless. And, his, and as his children, we can claim the power of the Holy Spirit as our own. We have to believe and receive, or trust and try. All it requires is the faith of a mustard seed. So for our time of reflection today, I found this uh, prayer. I have the Version Bible app on my phone, and it came across my screen, and I, it just seemed really powerful to me. So instead of asking questions and reflecting upon questions, I would like us to use this prayer as a, as a guide to talk to God and connect with his power and purpose for our lives. You can pray through this prayer on your own or just surrender this time to him and talk to God. Ask him to reveal the things that you need to loosen your grip on, to surrender. Commit to trust in him and try to live obedience, obediently in his will. So let's spend some time in prayer. And thank you again for this wonderful blessing. Thank you, Kim, for sharing with us. And um, yeah, just an encouragement to those of you that are here or anybody watching. Um, if God is stirring something up in you, right? If you're like, ah, God put his finger on something, maybe something exciting, something scary, what, whatever it is. Um, he, he initiates and we respond, right? And so if you felt like God was pointing at something today, then do something, just be faithful to respond to that. And a response, maybe the response is simply, to take something with you in prayer for the week. Maybe a faithful response is to have a conversation with somebody you trust about what you felt like God was doing with you this morning. Maybe a faithful response is you know there's something you need to do or stop doing, or I, I don't know what it is, but take whatever it is that the Spirit was doing in you this morning and respond to that, right? Just be faithful to do something with it um, that you feel like God is prompting you to do. So again, thanks, Kim, for preaching to us. And uh, I got a, a verse for us as a benediction. So if you guys want to stand. Um, and this is from, from Hebrews, the very end of the letter. <coughs> it's the benediction to, to the Hebrews from the author. And the author writes, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. 
and may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So go in peace.